allow me to introduce our moderator, Ibu Indung Dewi Puspita, MSc PhD, who will lead this session. Ibu Indung Dewi Puspita is a doctor in the field of applied microbiology. She has joined as a lecturer in the Department of Fisheries, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Gajah Mada since 2006. She completed her PhD in Hokkaido University, Japan at 2012. Her research interests cover the area of microbial safety of fisheries product and applied microbiology for seafood waste processing. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ibu Indun Dewi Puspita. Thank you very much, Ms. Fanny, for a very nice introduction. So, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's such a great honor for me to be here, uh, guiding all of the audience uh, through the next one and a half hour for the interesting presentation and discussion. So, today we will have three um, then will share their expertise with us and their names through their so papers that have been uh, referred in your research. So I think this is a great moment for us that we can have um, meeting and also discussion with them directly today. So uh, please allow me to take a few minutes to introduce our speakers today uh, briefly. So first speaker is Professor Rashid Sumaila. He is the professor at the University of British Columbia, Canada, and he is a tier one Canada research chair. For the information for the audience, um, Tier 1 Canada Research Chair are for outstanding researchers acknowledged by their peers as world leaders in their fields. So we are lucky today that we have him to be with us. And he has abundance experience working in fisheries and natural resource projects all over the world. He has published articles in many journals with a very and has generated a great deal of interest. And he will deliver a topic on sustainable ocean economy for today. Second, Sierda. She is a professor of fish pathology at the Institute of Aquaculture at College of Fisheries and Ocean Science, University of Philippines, Visayas. And she, one of them was the outstanding book and outstanding monograph from the National Academy of Science and Technology. She served as project leader of the UP Visayas Department of Science and Technology. She has authored and co-authored more than 60 publications in books, scientific journals, manuals, and served as a reviewer for scientific journals related to aquaculture. Her talk today will be related to sea lice in Southeast Asian aquaculture. And I will introduce our third speakers, Professor Dr. Sutawat Benjakun. He is a professor in International Center of Excellence in Seafood Science and Innovation, Faculty of Agro-Industry, Prince of Songkla University from Thailand. His major fields of interest are the seafood quality, fish processing by products, non-thermal process, and natural additive for shelf life extension of seafood products. Within approximately 20 years of your career path, he has been named as several prestigious award recipients. He has published more than 850 research articles in peer review international journal indexed by Scopus. And today he is going to deliver his talk on process development and nutritional properties of hydrolyzed collagen from fish skin. 
So that is a brief introduction of our um, famous keynote speakers. So I think we are very lucky today. We have three of them uh, being here with us. And before we start the, um, the presentation session, please allow me to remind all the distinguished uh, speakers that the allocated presentation time is 30 minutes. And please allow me to remind you if the time is about to finish. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, without any further introduction, let's restart our presentation session. And the first presentation, I would like to uh, invite Professor Rashid Sumaila to deliver his presentation. Professor Rashid, the time is yours. I'm sorry, you're still in unmute mode. Professor Rasid, can you unmute your microphone? Yeah, I think I'm on. Thank you. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, so I was saying thank you very much for the introduction. But before I go further, I want to say assalamu alaikum to all of you. Peace be unto all of you. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, it's always a pleasure to, to either come to Indonesia or to have the opportunity to work my, with my colleagues in Indonesia. The last time when uh, Yogyakarta, <laughs> I'm trying to get the, the, the name of the city well. It was such a pleasure. We had so much fun. We learned together and did so many things. And I miss that. I wish I was there now so I can get to eat all the good Indonesian food. But okay, next time. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, so the title of my talk is Identifying and Removing Barriers to Financing the Sustainable Ocean Economy. And uh, so, so that is the thing because recently I've dug into this and I'll tell you more about financing. Number one, we need a sustainable ocean economy and the, the two doctors before me mentioned that. And, and to be able to do that, you really need to have good quality and the right amount of finance to go into the ocean economy, uh, finance that supports nature, sustainability, and people. So that will be what I'll be discussing uh, in, this, in this 30 minutes. So this is the outline. Uh, I, will talk, I will talk about why we need to have a more sustainable ocean economy and also funding for that, you know? And uh, I'll start off by making the argument, which many of you already know, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to repeat these things because we need to really integrate this, why the ocean is so important for us as people so that we will learn to take good care of the ocean so it can take good care of us. So, so I start off by arguing that the ocean is actually our lives. You know, uh, Without the ocean, life would be really, really unbearable on earth. The, but the ocean at the same time is under threat. So, and, and, and we talk about the threats, there are many of them. And, and then the link to finance is that no matter how good your idea is, we all know that you can have the best idea in the world. If there's no finance, no financing, no investment, that idea can simply die. So, so good ideas can die at the altar of no finance or inadequate finance or inappropriate finance. So, and, and, and what we, I'm going to talk, I'm going to show that, or at least discuss and explain that current ocean finance is inadequate, uh, both in terms of quality and quantity. So then the question is, what do you do? Why don't we have enough financing? So uh, identifying barriers is very important starting point. Once you know what the barriers are, you can design policies and take action to actually remove the barriers. So that's the that's the plan. And this is a figure I like showing. I know many of you already know it, if not all of you. But again, I, I like to say this, especially when I have policy makers, when I have government people who are not fisheries people, ocean people, right? Uh, the, the first important fact is that the ocean is 70% of the surface of the earth. So if you have something and it's important to you, and you don't take good care of it, 70% of it, you are in trouble. 
right? I mean, this is a simple truism. What I tell my students is, if, if you were scoring 30% in your exams, you will never be in this class, right? So we need to take care of 70% of the F surface. So, so it's too big to mess up or too big to ignore. Now, because it's too big, doesn't mean we cannot mess it up. We cannot put it under stress. We cannot degrade it, right? Number three, because it's big, doesn't mean we cannot take care of it. You know, we, we people have the capacity, the brains, the resources, the, 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 the machines or whatever to help us manage the large ocean sustainably in true time. Now, fish, um, we're talking about fish in the ocean, wild fish, marine fish, but it applies to, 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 to fish uh, in our rivers and, and lakes and whatever. So if you look at this picture, I'm just trying to stress how important fish stocks are and the number of things that depend on the fish stock doing well, right? From this fish, we have our capture fisheries, the wild fisheries. Indonesia is big on this, as it was mentioned, number two in many instances, and, and I'm on the top five, no matter how you look at it. Indonesia is huge. But even agriculture, which is uh, many people believe agriculture can solve our problem, a lot of the fish we farm actually need wild fish as fish meal and oil. So there is a connection. Fish, seafood processing, all those working in the management, right? Think about research. I put my research here. If not for the fish, I will have to look for another job, right? And, and because the fish is what keeps us going, we've got to sustain it. Uh, it may be hard or not hard for me to get a job, but I will have to look for a job without the fish. So there are many reasons why we need to take care of the fish, because fish is the base for many economic activities. I like to say no fish, no, no food, no, no uh, fish protein, no, no macronutrients. There is no, no fisheries, and therefore there are no fish jobs. There will be no rupees coming from fish, right? So we, we need to take care of this central resource. Uh, now, apart from food and all we, we get the economics, 60% of the world's population lives within 60 kilometers of the coast. I'm sure this number has actually increased now. This was uh, a, a paper that, that stated this years ago, right? So just think about it. And it generates the... the Ocean generates about 50% of the oxygen on Earth. So the ocean is our life comes from this, actually, because this half life doesn't mean anything, right? If half of our oxygen is coming from the ocean, then it's really central to our lives. The ocean regulates the Earth's climate, right? It is crucial for the Earth's environmental balance and survival, and therefore the survival of people, right? So, so there are all these big valuable stuff. Cultural and spiritual values. I mean, I had a PhD student who actually studied the spiritual values of the ocean to people in British Columbia, Canada, right? And did a whole thesis on this. It means a lot for people. Transport and shipping without the ocean, huh, the world will be in deep trouble. The amount of goods that go on, on the ocean to reach people is unbelievable. It's also recreation, there's tourism, ecotourism. You go to watch whales, you go to do all sorts of things with the ocean, and, and that's important. And of course, we have lots of jobs created, and uh, Indonesia knows this livelihoods of people, incomes for businesses, right? And it is a source of animal protein, food security, nutritional security. Very, very important. There are places in Southeast Asia in West Africa and Latin America where fishing communities will have no animal protein in their diet without fish. So fish is very important. I just put out this uh, to show you how important this is in terms of jobs and not only globally, but also in large developing countries, including Indonesia. See here, when we estimated the number of people that depend on fish and fish or, or in the value chain, this is what we found in, in, in India. Millions of people, I mean, we're talking about what? My God, that's huge, right? And Indonesia is number three. You have all the large developing countries, uh, the Philippines and so on. And these jobs are important security-wise. Can you imagine all the tens of millions of young people 
in these countries, if they have nothing to do, what it means socially, economically, and so on. You know, years ago, in 2016, I had the chance of giving a talk just after President Obama had given a talk. It was an amazing day, right? And I put out this graph and I said, you remember when Mr. Obama became president? He was a young, handsome guy, didn't have any gray. And within a few years as president, he became gray. You remember that? And, and without these jobs, I told them he would have been grayer because this problem starts in Nigeria or in the Philippines, and they end up on the on the decks of our world leaders, including the US. So that's a huge service we get. All of this are happening, but the ocean is under threat. There are several threats. We are overfishing, we are catching the big fish, we are disturbing the habitat. You see that? Climate change is there, all the pollution, plastic, my God. Marine debris, oil spills, so lots of stresses. I've not even mentioned uh, ocean acidification, deoxygenation. So there are many issues that we need to tackle to make this sustainable. And this is just a picture just showing how climate change actually can affect life in the ocean. And, and the basic idea here is if the physics and the chemistry of the ocean is changing, the life of animals in the ocean will be affected. And so will our businesses, our ocean economy will be affected, the fisheries will be affected, our jobs, our food. So, so there, there's no how that the physics will change and organisms, populations, communities and ecosystems will not be impacted. And if they are impacted, our fish stocks will be impacted and therefore our fisheries will be impacted and all the things we get from them. Now, this is um, uh, so some of the things I'm showing you. They are whole papers. I'm just dropping them, and I have some references if you want to dig further. This is a paper we did looking at the gains from meeting the Paris Agreement. If we are able to take the temperature to 1.5 degrees or, or between 1.5 and 2 degrees, what will be the benefits? And lots of billions of dollars we could save, mainly for tropical developing countries. Because as you know, the ocean is warming. Fish, like people, like any living thing, you have a range of temperature that you thrive in. If, it is go, if you, the temperature goes outside that, you either move and follow the cold water if you can, or if you cannot, you perish. Or if you cannot move fast enough, right? And when we did all this calculation, what I'm showing you here, it's just a graph I took out of the, of the detailed paper, which you can find and read. It's open access. And here on this x-axis, that is the change in the catch potential, maximum catch potential you can take, say from Indonesian EEZ, right? And that's on the y-axis and all. This is a global study. And here is the amount of CO2 per capita pumped out by either countries or continents. So you have Africa here, right? And you have South America, you have Asia here. So this gives you an idea. If we were to implement the Paris Agreement, the potential of the fish catch for Asia will, will increase by about this amount. And Asia is actually mid-level, this average for the whole continent. So some countries, of course, pump more, like Japan, I suspect, and some countries pump pump less, right, like Bangladesh, but that's the average. Now look at Africa, pumps very little per capita, and the gains are higher. So with climate change, Africa is a big loser compared to Oceania, even though they don't pump out so much CO2. Most of it is for we, the people in the up north, we do the pumping, and yet look at Iceland. Iceland will actually look at North America. Right, and look, I think Iceland actually will do well uh, with climate change because the fish will be moving there. So this is just to show you very quickly, but uh, more explanations in the paper. The bottom line is, this is a very moral, economic and social graph. It tells you that what is happening with climate change is really not morally right. The people who pump less suffer more and, 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 and so on and so forth. So I thought I should share that. Another issue is illegal fishing and illicit trade. Another, in a recent paper we published last, last year, what we did was to try to trace IUU fishing, the illegal part, how it translates into illicit trade in fish stolen by illegal fishers 
and pump somehow landed into the economy. And so these countries and continents and the world actually loses legitimate revenues and economic impact. And, and as you know, Indonesia is famous uh, on his uh, uh, effort to reduce IE fishing, for example, which is a good thing to do because our estimate is that the world loses as much, nearly $50 billion a year of economic activity in various countries, including Indonesia, right? And, and uh, look at the income to people working in the sector, tax revenues. And that is what, this is the, the conceptual form, framework we use to track this thing now. Again, just to kind of let you be aware of this paper and what we did. And I'm saying all this, just highlighting some of the problems, all the stresses we are putting on the ocean and the consequences in terms of economics, in terms of jobs, in terms of incomes. So all of this actually have impact on people, right? So this, this graph, the top ones are from our group here at UVC. And this is from the FAO. And both our institutions are showing that more and more we are taking fish from systems that are overfished and, and, and in some cases collapse or, or really depleted uh, fish stocks. That's what this tells you. And the connection I'm making here is when we talk about sustainable oceans, ecosystem, marine ecosystem, of course, this, we care about the ecosystem. But actually, the point is if the ecosystem is in trouble, people end up being in trouble. So here it is, the guy says, is that all the shrimp I get after all the work, right? So this thing you will all know. And uh, you, fishers will go six hours and fill their quality of fish. And here you have an example of an environmental fish. This is becoming more again. So people are, human beings have brains, right? If you are in your coast and your village and everything is going down, the fish are gone, you don't just sit down and stop. You move. That's why immigration is a human thing. I mean, so, so all these things are happening, making the connection from nature to this. Now, what do you do? In some cases, we argue that you need to rebuild the pillated fish stocks. And these are all the kind of questions you have. In general, if you try to rebuild, nature is very kind. If you don't destroy it too much and you give it a break, it will come back. So one of the ways is to try to rebuild our depleted stocks. And our economics, that of the FAO and other colleagues shows that if we have the guts to do that, we will move away from the current low fish stocks, the misery, to a better place where we can get more feed to feed people and support people's livelihoods in our coastal communities. Now, how do you achieve this? I say fix the economics. Economics is a very powerful tool. Uh, we, we react to economic incentives. Most of us do. So, so, for example, I think that commercial fishers should be allowed to fish only if they don't lose money, that they, they, they make money. If you are fishing, if you're an indigenous fisher or you're a subsistence fisher, I can understand. You can fish because you are fishing to feed your people. But if you're fishing to make money, you better make money. So no harmful subsidies. No subsidies that lead to overfishing. The WTO is working now to try to deal with that. Rather than use the taxpayer money to destroy the fish that people depend on, use it to support the fishery so it can support people. All right? Illegal fishing, I've talked about it already, and Indonesia is really familiar with this. Economists will say, make the economics not, 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 good for illegal fishers, and most of them will stop, right? Usually they do it to make money. That's a basic economic theory. And many of our fish stocks are shared with the highest with other countries. So collaboration, collaborative management is important. And I'm sure Indonesia knows this. In many of the uh, fishing grounds you fish, you are not the only country in there. There are other countries you are just sent to the high sea. So we need cooperative management. So these are all points that I think we need to work on in order to sustain our fisheries, not only for our benefit, but for those of future generations, our children and grandchildren. Then marine protected areas is in the news a lot. Economists, I love it because it's like buying insurance. You protect yourself from errors, from mistakes. So it should be part of your tools uh, of trying to protect the ocean for the long term.
all of this demand money. You need finance. So now I'm getting into the finance. And, and I'm showing you this. This is uh, the cover page of our uh, Ocean Finance uh, report that we did for the, uh, for the high level panel for a sustainable ocean, which is made up of 14 heads of state, including the president of Indonesia. So Indonesia is very central in this effort. These are uh, current sitting heads of states from all over the world who have decided to come together to go with the leadership of the prime minister of Norway to really do the science, get science done, push the political system to ensure sustainable, uh, sustainable ocean, sustainable ocean economy. And the president of Indonesia is one of the, the leaders in this, which is great, right? Indonesia is an ocean nation in so many respects. Yeah. So what is an ocean economy? This is a simple summary. Many people define this in different ways. You have the extractable natural resources. It's also natural capital and you have marine and coastal development, knowledge, even the creation of knowledge and creativity. All those are part of the ocean economy and you have windmills and renewable energy, all those. So our report tried to talk about how to support this through ensuring that adequate finance goes into the sector. Now, some key messages here. The ocean is a cornerstone of the global economy, contributing trillions of dollars. According to the OAC, 1.5, OECD, I meant to say, 1.5 trillion dollars is, is what the ocean generates. And when we look at the details, less than 1% of the ocean economy is actually used to finance the protection of the ocean. Many of us will say, this is too low, come on. You generate 100 and you get only, only a rupee, right? That, that doesn't make sense, so we need to do that. And with all the things happening to the ocean, as I outlined, we definitely need to do more. To do this effectively and achieve a sustainable ocean economy, significantly greater finance needs to be made available. That's what we found. And, and I, I should have added, one of the authors of the Ocean Report and the paper that came out of it is Indonesian, uh, Anna Susi, actually. And so this is a global effort. There were 23 of us uh, and uh, from all over the world who, who, who put this thing together. So it's quite a diverse group. Now, talking about the barriers and opportunities, there are, we itemize a number of barriers. Again, please, the report is available. We had a paper which we published in uh, Nature Communications on World Ocean Day this year, on June 8th, you find it is open access, and we detail all this. For this talk, because of time, I will just summarize very quickly. So some of the barriers we found was distorted market dynamics. So you have all these subsidies messing up things. Uh, you have high financial insurance has a role to play also. Uh, so, so that is one, one thing we need to reduce the risk so that businesses can, can create innovative products and, and help us deal with that. And then you have gaps in information and knowledge, capacity building. We need a lot of young people to really get the knowledge so they can create these creative instruments to help get the necessary good quality finance together. And I say good quality finance. There's a lot of money going into the ocean. Uh, say, for example, oil and gas. According to the IMF, $4.7 trillion of subsidies go to oil and gas. If you ask an economist like me, no, that's not what you want to do because of all the externalities, the CO2 that is pumped out from that sector. So that's a lot of money, but it's not good quality money in the sense of sustaining our ocean economy. So you'll find a lot of this in the, in the paper. And then we talk about opportunities, how to really improve this. And uh, that's on that on this side of establish effective and stable regulatory environment. So you create the enabling environment so that individuals and companies and NGOs, everybody can go in there and actually contribute. And this basket here is made up of all sorts of new things, the new instruments that are being developed, like uh, debt for swap schemes. In, in the seashells, for example, the Paris group of countries creditors decided to reduce the interest payment of seashells, their, their, their debt. 
so that the savings can then be used to support managing the, the ocean. That's a clever thing. And there are many such instruments. So I put this graph here just to tell you two things. There are different types of funding sources. You can take on debt, which I don't recommend. You can do blended finance or a private sector and government, and you can do impact only investing. And you can use equity. You can you can do stocks and, and, and actually put them on the public. And all of these are being developed by all sorts of countries, South Africa, Ghana, Indonesia. There's a lady in Singapore. She has uh, an outfit to create bonds to support women businesses in Asia and around the world. So you have a lot of creativity going, going on. Now, enabling environment is important. I've actually talked about this thing redirect the harmful subsidies. We are not saying take the money, but let the money work for the people and the environment rather than undermine the environment and then harm people. You realign economic incentives, your tax systems, your fees and levies, those who create externalities, negative externalities cause harm to people, other people and to nature should actually be made to pay. Let the polluter pay, you remember that. Insurance can play. And, and, and an instrument and cat, cat, catalyzing new investments. And you have given some examples of that. Now, very quickly on MPAs, this is a, a study from, from Europe. They, they, they kind of found, we found out that actually it, it can be good business to really protect your environment properly because uh, this study, more than 100 scientists and economists of the world actually uh, made an estimate. And we found out that for every dollar you spend defending and protecting your ocean to make it sustainable, you can get $5 back, which is, which is not a bad deal at all. So a list of, the, of, the, of the, some of the barriers, government and public institutions, uh, essentially here we are saying we need all sectors. It's not only government or the private sector or even individuals or NGOs, every institution has a role to play, including individuals. So we itemize that. I won't get to go through each of them, but at least that is the list for you. And in the paper and in the in the in the in the report, you find more more about this. Addressing barriers, there is a role again for all sectors. Private finance is needed in many places. Increased finance and investment in a sustainable ocean economy. I told you that we use less than one percent of the economic uh, impact generated from the ocean. How about we make this 2%, 3%, 4%? That will bring in more resources to create the environment so the private sector can do a, a good job at financing a lot of this. And yeah, there's more here uh, on, on, on how to do this. And uh, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into them one by one. And that, but essentially the point is there are barriers and there are ways to, to deal with those barriers. And I think I'm at the end of this. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to do this and I look forward to questions and answers. I hope I'm, I'm within my time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Rashid, for the very interesting presentation about the how important the um, sustainable ocean economics and also the explanation about the barriers and opportunities to the ocean finance. I guess there are many questions that um, the audience would like to uh, ask. Um, please, for the audience, if you have any question, you can um, type your question in the uh, comment column in the under the uh, Zoom menu in your uh, computer. And then we will go through the uh, question and answer session uh, later on. Mm -hmm. So uh, Professor Rashid, can you, uh, do you still have time until the um, end of the plenary session for the question and answer? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now let me proceed to the second presenters. Uh, we have Professor Erlinda, who will give a talk uh, about the uh, sea lice in Asian uh, aquaculture. Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, probably good afternoon and good evening to our other colleagues in other parts of the world. Good morning, everyone. 
before before you play my my huh? you have started a bit, may i may i take this opportunity to personally thank the organizers of the fourth is uh, mfr uh, 2021 uh, especially uh, to dr uh, inda for uh, uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, symposium and to, of course, to all the staff of uh, University Gajah Mada. Thank you very much. Okay, so maybe we can start now. Okay. Good morning, everyone. The uh, title of my presentation is Realized Research in the Asia Southeast Asian Aquaculture. The Southeast Asian region offers a great potential for marine aquaculture. Marine fish production in the region is focused on high value species such as groupers, snappers, and sea bass for the live fish market. Other marine species commercially cultured are ciganids, pompano, cobia, and milkfish. Culture of this species are done in square or circular floating net sea cages using various uh, kinds of materials such as wood and uh, high density polyethylene for the cage framework. The uh, rapid growth of aquaculture activities in the past decade brought about by the increased demand and intensive intensification led to an increased environmental impact and an increased risk of infection with disease causing agents. Pathogens such as bacteria, parasites and viruses are introduced into the cages through the seedlings or are simply transferred through wild stocks living in the surroundings. Parasite infection among cage cultured fish has been a major problem in the aquaculture industry, including the ASEAN region, threatening its production efficiency, economic viability, and the long-term sustainability. In the ASEAN region, sea lice have emerged as one of the most dangerous parasitic copepods. Their impacts range from mild skin damage to stress, smotic problems, secondary infections, and mortality. In Thailand, about 80% of sea bass farms have been observed to have sea lice infection that resulted into 30 to 50% loss of stock. This presentation provides the current state of knowledge on sea lice in the aquaculture in aquaculture in the ASEAN region, including a brief biology of sea lice, uh, sea lice species that have been reported in the region. We identified a significant species of sea lice in the region and some known treatment measures to control the infection. Information were sourced from published materials and through communication with sea lice researchers in the region. Research needs of the region are also presented. Okay, for the biology of sea lice, sea lice belong to order Copepoda and family Caligidae. The, door, the body is torso ventrally flattened and divided into four parts. The cephalothorax, the fourth pedigree, the genital complex, and the abdomen. The cephalothorax is responsible for attaching to and performing rapid locomotion on the host fish. On the ventral side, the cephalothorax carries paired appendages, including the antennae and the 
axillae, which are used as clamps. Sea lice feed on, mu on mucus, epithelial cells, or blood of their host by pressing their tubular mouth onto the host's skin and grazing the tissues using their mouth parts. The fourth pedigree provides major flexion of the body and it carries the fourth leg. The genital complex carry is a storage area for the gametes. The abdomen together with the paired caudal rami function as part of the rudder in swimming. Sexual dimorphism is recognizable in adult sea lice. The female is larger than the male. The female has a more prominent genital segment than the male. Paired egg strings are produced by the adult female from the posterior portion of the genital segment. Globally, more than 500 species of sea lice have been reported, and about 45% of these are reported from Asian waters. Sea lice have 37 genera, with Caligus and Leopterus as the most common. About 250 species of Caligus and more than 100 species of Leopterus have been identified. The lunules are an accessory attachment organ and are present in Caligus, but absent in Leptopterus. The morphology of the fourth pedigree, the genital complex, and the fourth leg are used to differentiate between genera. Generally, the life cycle of Caligus comprises nine stages and 10 stages in Leopterus. In Caligus epidemicus, however, 11 stages have been described. The eggs hatches as nucleus one and molts into nucleus two. Nucleus one and nucleus two are non-feeding. They are planktonic and positively phototactic. The nucleus 2 develops into an infected uh, copepodid and the planktonic copepodid must find a host in three to four days. The copepodid will attach to the host by means of its antennae. The attached copepodid develops into chelimus 1, molds into chelimus 2, three, four, five, and six. All the chalimai stages are sessile and parasitic on the host skin. Chalimus six develops into the pre-adult stage, then the adult stage. The pre-adult and adult stages are mobile and parasitic. The whole life cycle is completed in 17 days at temperatures of 24 to 25 degrees centigrade and a salinity of 20 ppt. Per unpublished data of the group of Dr. Kuwa in Malaysia, the life cycle of Caligus epidemicus is completed in eight or nine days at 27 degrees centigrade and 28 ppt. In the next few slides, I will present the sea lice species recorded on farmed and wild caught fishes in the region. The list herein presented may likely be incomplete as there are many unpublished materials and or written in languages other than English. Table one shows a list of reported sea lice from farmed fishes in Indonesia with two identified species and a number of unidentified species of Caligus and Leptopterus, parasitic on various grouper species. This list has been kindly verified by Dr. Isti of Fishery Research Center 
of Jakarta and Dr. Hilal Anshari of Hanasuddin University. Caligus Pachulus on farm milkfish was mentioned in a 1980 publication. Recently, Pseudo Caligus uniartus has been reported to have caused mass mortality among uh, breeders of two ciganid species maintained in floating cages. Incidentally, the valid name for Pseudo Caligus now is Caligus based on recent molecular studies. But for easier reference to related literatures, I will refer to it as Pseudo Caligus. From wild caught fishes in Indonesia, species, 14 species of sea lice have been recorded parasitic on 16 host fish species belonging to four orders and 12 families. In Malaysia, eight species of Caligus and a number of unidentified Caligus species have been reported among farmed fishes. High fish mortalities have been associated on Caligus or with Caligus epidemicus and Caligus minimus on snapper, grouper, and Sibas. Caligus rotundinalis infection also caused mortalities in snapper and hybrid grouper. A number of unidentified Caligus species have also been recorded on Sibas, snapper, cobia, and grouper in 1980s. It appears that the important species of sea lice on farm fishes in Malaysia include Caligus epidemicus, minimus, and rotundi genitalis infecting sea bass, snapper, and grouper. It is noted that after the reports in 1980s, the succeeding works on sea lice came in 2009 and thereafter. Ten species of sea lice have been recorded on ten species of fish caught from the wild in Malaysia. Okay, table five gives a checklist of sea lice species on farmed fishes in the Philippines. Caligus epidemicus was recorded on 10 host fish species belonging to three orders and eight families. Caligus epidemicus on sea bass and ciganid. Caligus patulus on milkfish and Lepiopteus pinifer on pompano were associated with disease condition and or mortality of host fish species. However, there was no record of disease condition or mortality due to Caligus patulus infection since its first report in 1977. Thus, based on these findings, Caligus epidemicus and Leopropterus pinifer are the most important sea lice species on farm fishes in the Philippines. Table 6 gives the 15 sea lice species recorded from 20 host fish species from the wild in the Philippines. Caligus epidemicus has been recorded on four host fish species belonging to two orders and four families. From farm fishes in Thailand, I could only retrieve the works of Dr. Chinabut. And there may be more, but it appears that Caligus epidemicus is a significant sea lice species in the country. 
Table A shows the sea lice species parasitic on wild caught fishes in Thailand. Seven species of sea lice and a number of unidentified species of Caligus have been recorded from 14 host species. It is very likely that this list is incomplete as only three reports could be retrieved. One in 1996, then in 2007, 2008, and in 2020. It is also highly possible that only a few scientists in Thailand are working on sea lice. Table 9 shows the reported sea lice species parasitic on farm fishes in Vietnam. It shows that Carligus epidemicus infects sea bass, grouper, red tilapia, and Cobia. Table 10 shows the five spe uh, species of sea lice parasitic on four host species caught from the wild in Vietnam and an unidentified species of Caligus and Yepteptarus. Similarly, these two tables could be incomplete as there are many materials written in Vietnamese language that could not be retrieved. Based on this information, 42 sea lice species parasitic on farmed and wild caught marine fishes have been recorded in the Southeast Asian re region. Globally, this represents about 10% only of the known species. There may be many unidentified species, but only a handful of researchers are working in this field. So I take this opportunity to encourage our students and young researchers to consider this potential field of research. Among the sea lice species reported in the region, Caligus epidemicus, Caligus minimus, Caligus rotundi genitalis, Lepiopterus pinifer, and Pseudocaligus uniartus are considered as the most important species, causing disease conditions and significant mortalities among infected host fishes. Next, I will discuss the five most significant sea lice species in the region. First is Caligus epidemicus. In our paper published as Ho et al. in 2004, Caligus epidemicus was recorded on all 10 host fishes examined. This indicates its low host specificity, often at 100% prevalence, at varying intensity of infection, as high as 5,000 on a single host fish as observed in surgeon fish. In our 2011 paper, we reported sea lice infestation among ciganid breeders in land-based tanks and pond-reared sea bass fingerlings. Sea bass breeders showed extensive erosion and hemorrhagic lesions on the anteroventral side of the body surface, including the pectoral and pelvic fins and the eyes. A 10% mortality was recorded among infected fish. Heavy infestation of sea lice was observed on the ciganids, where 96% of the 